This is episode 49. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears, and this is the show where we talk about what they didn't teach us in school, how to run a great business. Now, I just wanted to start off today's show by telling everyone, all my listeners out there, about a competition that's coming up. It is the, it's a business plan competition for architects or aspiring architects. And this is put on by the Charette Group. You can go to architectbusinessplancompetition.com to find out more details. The Architect Business Plan Competition is intended to foster a dialogue about the importance of entrepreneurship to the future of the architecture profession. The competition is open to registered architects in the U.S. or Canada who have considered starting a design firm or who have operating or existing design firm experience for five years or less. There's no fee to enter. And the prize, first prize winner will receive a $10,000 prize. Second prize winner will receive $2,500. So if you're considering this, I encourage you to do that. I know there will be some free training that will be involved in those people who sign up for this in terms of some technical support and assistance in creating a business plan. So if you're a new firm or you're thinking about starting a firm, this is an excellent opportunity. You can go to architectbusinessplancompetition.com or businessofarchitecture.com forward slash plan. And that is not a paid ad. That is just something that I believe in that will help the profession. So um, to start off today, I have a quote here I'd like to share with you. And it goes like this. It's unwise to pay too much, but it's worse to pay too little. For when you pay too little, sometimes you lose everything because what you paid for is incapable of doing what it was bought to do. That is a quote by John Ruskin. And it was given to me by today's guest, Steve L. Wintner. Steve is the founder and principal of Management Consulting Services, a professional consulting firm located in the Austin, Texas area, and focused on enhancing the productivity and profitability of professional design firms. He's the co-author of the book, Financial Management for Design Professionals, The Path to Profitability. Now, if you've been following the show for a while, you remember the very first episode of the show I had Osha Wilson on. She was talking about how she started her architecture firm, and she mentioned this book. And I'm happy to say that shortly after Osha talked about this book, it was sold out. And right now, it's actually very difficult to find it. It's going for about $200 right now. You can find it on the web. I think there's, I saw some on Amazon or some on eBay. But it's currently very difficult to get a copy of this book. And I think it speaks to the value that architects are finding in the things that it, that it contains. So, Steve, welcome to the show. Enoch, thanks so very much, and I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, have a chance to visit with you about this. If I may, I'd like to make a brief comment about the price of the book, though, as as a correction that's uh, more current. Uh, because Amazon is sold out, the resellers are trying to sell it. Uh, you can get it for $90, which, again, is an absurd price. But I have noticed that you could actually go to uh, some place like uh, Barnes and Noble, and actually ask to order it, and they will order it for you for the original price point of forty nine ninety five. You could probably also go to Kaplan uh, AEC Education uh, Publishers and ask them if they will still sell it to you at the original price point. Because as of last year, we were able to get others to buy it at that price point. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Steve, I'm sure you'll make you make some listeners out there happy to know that it's still available at the the lower price point. But having That's having good. said that, you're working on a new and updated version of this book, and yes. tell tell me about that. Tell me what this what inspired this new book and kind of how the process is going and what it's going to contain. Well, it was all born out of the fact that Kaplan uh, decided not to do a second printing of the book, even though there were no more books available. They were they were all out of their copies, except for a small number that they do still have, uh, but not able to fill any kind of real orders. And so they decided that because of the volume of selling, which for them wasn't up to their standards, that they weren't going to do a second printing. We contacted Kaplan, Michael Tardif and I, my co-author and I, 
and asked them if they would be willing to allow us to do a second printing. And, and we got into a long conversation, and uh, the short outcome of that was that they eventually gave us full right title and ownership of the copyright for the manuscript and allowed us to uh, have it so that we can do whatever we wished with it. And so Michael and I are now in the process of rewriting it for our second publication, which will be an electronic version of the book, not a paper version of the book. And it'll probably be uh, in a Kindle format or an e-book format, and uh, hopefully that'll be sometime before the end of the year. Excellent. What valuable information are architects going to find in the new manuscript? Well, it's not going to be a whole lot different than the other manuscript, the original printing. It's just that we're cleaning it up. There were a lot of things in it that we now, uh, in retrospect, have gone back after seeing it, reading it, uh, and, and understanding a little bit more about what we wrote, that we could have been a little bit more clear in the things that we described and how we described them, and probably be a little bit more expansive about other things that we didn't talk enough about. So that's basically what we're doing. We're we're cleaning it up. We're expanding it where it needs to be expanded. We're contracting it where it didn't need to be as long as it was, and we're we're still maintaining the same basic format. So the book isn't going to really change per se. It's just going to be a better version. I know that in the book you talk about the seven key performance indicators that a design professional should be looking at. You talk about um, reporting ways to structure mm-hmm. that you talk about and we're going to we're going to touch on a lot of that now in in this interview. Mhm. Okay. So just to give our 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 listeners an overview in this in this in this interview today we're going to be talking about some common management uh, deficiencies that Steve sees when he works with professional design firms. He's going to talk about why a systematic approach is important in your business, how that can help you boost productivity and boost profit. And also we're going to talk a little bit about in the in the next episode, which is going to be next week, we're going to dive into the financial management side of things. So I'm looking forward to the conversation, Steve. Thanks for, once again, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. So Steve, what are some common management deficiencies that you see when working with professional design firms? Well, I don't know that the word deficiency is the right word for describing uh, these things. Uh, you know, every firm is unique, in my opinion, and, and they bring with it their talent, their skill, their abilities, their knowledge, their experience, and, and it's all different because of the mix of individuals that, that are part of each firm. But in, in general, just a very general statement, I'm not trying to make a, a global statement that specifically says the whole profession, but in general as a statement, I think because of my focus on my work that I do, I have found that there's a, there is really a lack of true understanding and knowledge about financial management systems, which are born out of what they, most firms now usually use as a, some kind of accounting software, AE software that you know everybody uh, isn't able to purchase them because they're expensive, but there are only three of them on the market right now, Dell Tech, Axiom, and uh um, the third one, it, it, yeah, clear focus in profile, clear, clear. Hmm. <laughs> the third one just went away. Anyway, there's three of them, and uh, and they don't really know what to do with all that material. I mean, that's so much information to them; it overwhelms them, and so they kind of tend to rely upon their accounting people, either their in-house staff who are doing their accounting and bookkeeping or an outside CPA or accountant to help them to get through this. But they truly don't understand. So that's one of the areas that I think is the greatest area of concern for me is that they, they, they really do need, as as principals of a firm, as the CEO, as the, as the people running the firm, they really do need to know and understand what their financial status is, what their condition is, rather than just referring to a report that tells them that. Uh, the second thing is that I think there's really an, a lack of awareness about the importance of creating some kind of an employee retention policy. And by that I mean that there's always a statement in our profession that says that our, our people are our greatest assets, our staff are our greatest assets. Well, I, I think that's really lip service 
because I don't think too many firms really actually do that. They don't really look after their staff. I happen to be fortunate enough to have had an experience working with a firm that did that to the nth degree. They were very, uh, in, very focused on the importance of developing and improving the relationship with their staff, as well as giving them the kind of guidance and the kind of training that they needed so they could begin to be a greater contribution to the firm and then begin to share in the wealth of the firm that they had helped to create. The third thing might be uh, a, a really simple thing, but yes, it has a lot to do with the act of communication, which I think is a, is a, I call that a deficiency. Most of us do not know how to properly and effectively communicate in the work environment, nor do we try to take the time to learn how to do that to the best possible way. But I think that this area is the area of learning how to delegate and manage one's time. The area of time management and delegation, I think, are two areas that suffer from a real clear understanding about an appropriate and beneficial way of doing those things. Uh, Stephen Covey was probably, for me anyway, uh, the greatest impetus that I could have about learning about how to delegate properly, and he kept it really, really simple. There were only two forms of delegation as far as he was concerned. And the, and the, the area of time management, I basically contribute to an unknown author who said simply, only do what only you can do as a mantra for how to operate if you're going to be in a CEO position. You can't do everything, so you have to learn how to delegate. So you, you should learn to delegate everything that only you can do and let everybody else do the rest. But within that comes a whole deal of understanding how to delegate properly, how to communicate effectively so that the outcomes are what you expect and want them to be. Excellent. So I'm going to go back to the first point here, Steve, which is that you said you find that a lot of firms don't understand some of the finer points of accounting. And I'm just paraphrasing. So if I misstate you, please correct me. But I'd like to ask you, what is it specifically? Maybe give me one or two examples of what you see that they're not understanding. Well, it's not the finer points. I mean, after all, Nothing in our educational process helped us to understand accounting procedures. Right. So we know we know really nothing about accounting. Everything that I know about accounting is self-taught, or or done because I I've, I've been interested and needed to learn more about it. But I still don't know what I really would need to know if I was going to become an accountant. I know enough, quote unquote, to be dangerous. However, I don't deal with accounting. I deal with financial management, with it, which is an aspect of accounting but it's more internalized to the firm. It doesn't have any impact on the firm's uh, tax liability or it doesn't have anything to do with whether it meets government standards or things of that nature. It, it only helps to under, better understand how the, the firm is functioning and performing and how well they're doing financially on a month-to-month -month basis. So it's really a lack of really knowing what accounting offers. And, and we've been so tuned in to know that you know, you have a limited number of options about how to get the information out of your system, out of your accounting procedures. So basically that comes down to those three accounting systems that I talked about uh, or something like QuickBooks, which is probably the worst of all possible software systems that a service firm could use. Why do you say that? Well, because it really has nothing to do with the operations of a service firm, even though they have improved on it greatly. Uh, they put out a thing called Professional Services Edition, which I think is an enormous help and an enormous stride in the right direction, but it still contains a lot of the things that are just not helpful, and, and it lacks a lot of things that should be in there that they don't provide. So those are the things that come out of the work that I've been doing for the last 29 years that are all related to what I refer to lovingly as the Maddox format. Mm -hmm. Give me one or two examples, and I'm sure this is in the Maddox format, but give me one or two examples of things that uh, QuickBooks does not provide that's important for a professional services firm. Well, there's no, there's no delineation of the difference between uh, direct labor and indirect labor. It's just labor. And they call it cost of goods sold. Well, I mean, that doesn't mean anything. There's no such thing as goods sold. We don't sell anything. We sell time. Uh, we don't have a product. All we do is sell our time. So in that, they don't, they don't delineate between 
what we consider to be direct labor focused on projects or indirect labor focused on things that are beyond the project, that are not project related, that are not chargeable to a project. That's a very major area of that. They also don't know how to properly format the profit and loss statement to reflect the relationship between their revenue and the revenue that's created by having outside consultants contribute to a project and what those those are expenses and how those expenses should be subtracted from the revenue, mm-hmm. which is the basic flaw with the other three systems as well. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, you described, you talked about direct labor and indirect labor, and you gave us sort of a contextual definition. I'm just going to repeat to see if I understand it correctly, and you can correct me where I go astray. It sounded like direct labor is labor that is directly um, related or billed to one particular project, whereas... Uh, correct the word. Okay. Get the word billed. Okay. There's no such thing as billable time. Ooh. <laughs> the only true billable time is a project that has an hourly fee contract and without any limitation. So you just bill for whatever you spend your time on. Mm-hmm. Those jobs are very few and far between if they ever exist, and they're usually the kinds of pro- projects that small firms, individuals have that operate on a very small basis. But they're very, very hard to come by. Clients don't want to do that. We have a much more sophisticated client base right now, and so you very rarely see an hourly without any kind of ups- upside limit to how much you can invoice the client. So instead of billable, the correct terminology is chargeable. In other words, whatever you do on a project is chargeable to the project. Whether it gets billed or not is a different story. And if most projects are are actually invoiced to the client on a percent of completion, which most of them are because they're based on a fixed fee, so all you can base it on is some percentage of that fixed fee, then none of the hours are truly billable. Because you're not billing hours, you're billing percentage of the fee, which is relative to the amount of hours spent, but not truly directly related to the hours spent, simply because the hours spent may be excessive. They may not be controlled. They may have already blown the budget in terms of their direct labor. But it is a reference to the time charged to the project. Okay. So direct labor is chargeable. Right. Okay. Indirect labor is labor that, I guess, anything else? Any other time spent that's not project-related. Okay. All right. And so when you mentioned that QuickBooks has no ability to differentiate between direct labor and indirect labor, what does that mean for an architecture firm? If they can't tell, if they can't delineate those two, how does that affect their business? It doesn't mean they don't have the ability to. It means I'm just simply saying they don't do that. They could do that just just as easily as the other the other three accounting software systems do it. So could QuickBooks. But they, they don't happen to have that right now, as far as I'm aware of, to, to my knowledge. They don't have yet come to that level of sophistication in, in their professional services edition of QuickBooks. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean for architecture firms if they can't tell how much time was spent through their accounting software on direct labor versus indirect labor? Well, then they'll they'll never be able to ascertain the true level of their profitability. They'll never be able to ascertain a true overhead rate or a break-even rate, which means they'll never be able to get to coming up with a reasonable or, or accurate or beneficial billing rate. Sounds important to me. Yeah. All right, so that's a good example. Now, let's. the second thing you mentioned was no employee retention policy. And you said that – you just said some firms don't take care of their staff. What did you mean by that, that when you say you see some firms that don't take care of their staff? Well, I'm simply saying that there isn't a focus on their internal resource, their great resource of labor that they have to nurture them, develop them, train them, and try to encourage loyalty and and an ability to contribute to the firm's growth and development and profitability through that kind of development. They just take them for granted. It's like they they are the drones. They'll feed them information. They'll give them what they need to know and not anything more than they need to know and expect the best out of them. Well, that's that's an unreasonable expectation. Uh, They are valuable to the firm. Every single one of them, right down to the individual who sits at a 
at a desk and does nothing but administrative duties, even if they don't have any project-related duties. They are an essential part of the firm. Respecting them and what their needs are to be successful in their job and helping them be as successful at their, at their job is the best kind of a policy to have because it will help to retain them. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I've, I've talked to – I've talked sorry, to... I, I just want to say, employees don't leave a firm because they're happy there. They leave because they feel like they're not getting what they wanted. They need to develop and grow, especially young architects who are just coming into the industry or looking for greater knowledge and, and improving themselves. So they're always going to look for something else. Now, they may also feel like they're not getting paid enough, which is another factor that I think is, is rampant in our industry. Uh, there is not enough of a distribution of the wealth, as I call it, between mm-hmm. upper management and the staff. So how how could that be fixed? I mean, talk, talk let's 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 jump onto that topic for a minute. Uh, you know, let's talk about some staff who feel like they're not recompensed or uh, they're not getting the the pay that they would like. So okay, so you you come back to an essential ingredient that is. Do you really understand what you have in the way of financial resources to be able to provide the best possible compensation for your staff in order to retain their services and to make sure that you get the best out of them so they help to contribute to that resource each and every year? So if you don't have the right tools, which are your financial management system tools, then you're not going to be able to come up with a good decision, a good sound decision that's based on reality. You're going to have some indication of what that is, but it could lead to problems. It just depends. Mm -hmm. Most of our firms, in in the AIA environment, most of the firms are small firms, which means less than 10 people. The preponderance of the 80,000 architects in AIA are less than 10 people firms. So if that's the case, then... You've got to understand that there's not going to be a whole lot of dollars flowing into a little small firm. So every dollar that comes in has got to be managed and cared for and properly taken care of and used as effectively as possible to generate the best possible return. So in your experience, when when you say that you see firms aren't taking care of their staff, do you see it as a, a conscious choice or more of an ignorance No, I think it's not conscious at all. I don't think it's deliberate. I don't think it's malicious. I don't think it's anything more than a lack of focus, Mm -hmm. a lack of recognizing that there are things that could be done. It isn't going to take brain surgery. It isn't going to take a whole lot of money and effort to do this. It just takes a caring about, a change in your mentality and mindset about understanding the value of your people and then helping them to help you to get what you want. They're there for that very purpose, to produce the product that you want to produce for your clients so your clients are happy, they keep coming back. But if you you don't treat them well, they're not going to stick around. And that's the way a lot of firms lose some really good talent. Give me an example of something that a firm could do to differentiate themselves and flip that on its head and retain their their employees, their good talent. All right. Well, that that could go back to... uh, the one thing that a lot of firms do. Some don't do it well enough, some don't do it enough, some don't do it at all. And that is a performance review for each employee. Uh, The question then begs, how often do you do an employee review? You know, is it an annual review? Is it a semi-annual review? Is it a quarterly? It's it's up to the firm. It's up to the management of the firm to decide what works best for them. Uh, It's time-consuming. There's no question about the amount of time it takes to do a good performance review. So that'll, that'll play into the frequency of it very easily. Could, can, could mean that it'll stop being anything more than maybe once a year or twice a year at the very most. But it's the content of that review, the focus of that review, that could lead to this kind of change. Uh, it's, not, it's not a review to go back and beat someone over the head for the mistakes they made for the last 12 months. <laughs> it's better a tool to be used at looking at the next 12 months and setting goals for their accomplishments so that in the end of that year, you can go back and review those goals to see if they actually achieve them. But if you don't set goals in the first place for these people, if you don't help them to understand what you're expecting of them, if you don't give them a path to walk on that they clearly have guidelines and understanding of what direction is and what you expect, how can they possibly succeed? So it's it's not hard to believe that these kinds
kinds of reviews turn out to be more a matter of disgruntlement after it's over on the part of the employee because all they got was a lot of beat up. They got beat up. They got made wrong. They got told what was wrong with them. Mm. There was no direction for helping them. Now, again, I'm not condemning my profession. I'm not condemning every firm. I'm just simply saying that's something that's rampant in the firm, and there are a lot of firms that do it really, really well. But it takes an understanding of what that means. What it's, what's its purpose? Why do you do it? What are you trying to accomplish? What's your objective? What's your intention? And that has to start, in my opinion, with a caring about the individuals in your firm and helping them to do the best they possibly can so they can help you. Excellent. So we're talking about employee retention here, and you talked about changing the way that we do employee reviews, giving them a clear path and goals to strive forward, and then measuring that. Now, I know, Steve, that you are working on a new book that's going to be talking about the culture of accountability in professional design firms. Mm -hmm. What are some other ways that professional design firms need to have more accountability? Well, uh, I I, I even question the word more accountability. Oh, (laughs) I'm I'm sorry, but with all due respect to all of my professional colleagues, and I don't have full knowledge of every single firm in the United States. Uh, but I, it's been my experience being exposed to a great deal of my colleagues' uh, operations over the last 29 years that there is precious little in the area of accountability established in a firm as a culture, as a value. I don't, I don't think it, again, is done because of any kind of malicious uh, intent I think that it's just a lack of focus. It's a lack of recognizing what is the purpose of such a thing. Why would you do such a thing? What's the benefit that comes from it? But it's just another part of this employee retention program. It's about creating an environment in which everybody is pulling in the same direction for the same reason, with the same goals in mind, and then being rewarded as they do perform and they do create and contribute to the kind of environment that is desired by the principals. So that requires everybody from the principal down, the CEO, the partner, the owner, the the single one owner of this firm, or all of them, being willing to be held accountable themselves. And for me, personally, in my opinion, therein lies the problem. Very few principals that I've been in touch with are willing to be held accountable for their behavior. In fact, they think that they are above being held accountable because... Who's going to question them? Who's going to look at me objectively and give me an objective feedback about my accountability? Who's going to hold me accountable? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a narrow-minded thought process, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's not seeing a bigger picture. That's not recognizing the possibilities and the potential for what's available to you if you became more uh, knowledgeable about the process and learned more about it which is one of the reasons that stimulated me into believing that I need to write about this, that I need to put out more information about this, because I don't know very much, if anything, it's available in the marketplace about this subject that pertains to our industry. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to to reading it when it comes out, Steve. And when you say, you know, that's an interesting concept, accountability for firm principals and firm owners, tell me what that looks like. Uh, in, in what way would they be accountable and on what status would they be measured or help me understand that how that would be applied? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example that goes back to the performance review. And by the way, it's not accountability just for firm owners and firm principals. It's accountability as a culture for the firm, period. Okay? Uh, it, it's no less important than any one thing that the firm does or has as a value, as a uh, system as a way of operating. It's just an integrated part of it. It's how they operate. It's how they function. It's how they work together. What is the environment? And and that kind of an environment will promote a greater sense of ownership, a greater sense of being a part of the whole, a greater sense of contributing to the whole, and then being properly and appropriately rewarded for their efforts. So I think that the the, the purpose here is to Uh, bring forward, as I said, it goes back to an employee performance review. 
that in and of itself could be a way to help begin this process because it becomes a, a place in which a dialogue that's open, candid, and sharing could go both ways. In other words, there could be performance reviews down to the people who are subordinate to you, but then there should also be a, a review that comes back upwards of the people who are your supervisors. It, it shouldn't be a top-down management policy is what I'm basically saying, mm -hmm. which is the way most firms function. I'm not talking about a democratic, across the board, everybody's equal kind of thing. No, I'm not establishing that. Everybody has their place in the firm. Everybody has their responsibilities in the firm. But those things have to be clearly delineated. Mm -hmm. Can you give me that a everybody? Can you give me a practical sorry. example or a tactical example of what that would look like? Maybe a change that people listening today could go back and implement in their firms to foster this kind of accountability culture. Sure. Let's let's just start with one little basic thing that has to do with communication of expectations to your employees. Let's say that I'm a ten-person firm. Okay, I'm a single owner. Nobody else but me. I'm the boss. I'm the top guy. There's no one else there but me, and then I've got all the rest of my employees, great employees. Now, I don't know how widespread this is. I don't have any statistical data that tells me what this is, and I'm not making any claims one way or the other. But it would be so helpful to my nine employees, <clears throat> excuse me, if I could define for them what their roles and responsibilities were within the functions that they are best suited for. In other words, creating a position description for how they are expected to work and what their roles and responsibilities are within that role. That's clarifying for them a, a, a pathway, a way of getting to the kinds of results that one is shooting for that allows them to then look at it, read it, understand it, if they have questions about it, if they, if they do question things that they don't think are appropriate to discuss it. It's an open dialogue when you present it. It's just not implemented as this is the policy, this is the rule, this is who you are, this is what the, the, the niche you fall into, and that, by the way, is not a niche. You're not just assigned this, this label that you are a project architect. You are a CAD uh, designer. You are a project manager. You are whatever you are a construction administrator. That I mean, you may wear multiple hats. Most small firm employees have to wear multiple hats. That's the function and the operation of a small firm. So you have to define those positions clearly so they understand what's expected of them. Some of them will know clearly. Some of them will have the experience to automatically understand that. But you can't assume that they know. You want to put it out there so you can develop the best possible resource for them to understand and to perform to the expectations that you have for your firm. Okay, so delineate a very clear expectation and goals that employees can then, and even firm principals, can use to guide their behavior? Is that, am I understanding well, you correctly? Well, I, I wouldn't use the word expectations. I would say to, to, define, to define for them the roles and responsibilities of their position of the things that they do, the activities that they are most likely to be engaged in on a regular basis, okay. periodically or, or re routinely. Mm -hmm. Okay, in, in bigger firms, it's more it's more segmented, it's more horizontally cut. Uh, it could be it could be any number of things, but you know, project managers do project manager work, project architects do project architect work, project designers do project design work. Well, in small firms, that's not the case. The project designer could be the project architect and the project manager. Okay, mm -hmm. so what are the roles of those three kinds of titles? You know, this isn't something you're going to put on a business card. I'm a project manager. Okay, not if you wear three hats, you're not. <laughs> it's just one thing you do. But the question is, what are, what are the expectations for doing what you do? What does it include? What does it entail? What, what's expected of you? in terms of functioning as effectively as you possibly can in that role. That becomes a dialogue between you and these individuals so that in a collaborative way you, you develop this position description for these titles that anybody in the firm could wear, including you, the owner. You might have to be the project manager on a number of projects or the project designer on a number of projects and likely are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's... Thank you, Steve. Let's talk about uh, remuneration because you mentioned that that's part of this process is being able to reward 
and I don't know if it's monetary or what other ways, but tell me your insights about how to retain good talent through rewarding them for their 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 performance, I guess. Okay. Well, you know, for me, it's about human nature. Every one of us, uh, myself included, certainly, always will ask this question, what's in it for me? When I'm asked to do something that I'm not accustomed to doing or that's different or that's a change that's expecting me to do something that I'm not accustomed to, I need to learn to do, my question, whether I ask it out loud or whether I think it to myself is, well, what's in it for me if I do this? That's a natural response. Mm -hmm. So in order to overcome that, that inertia that's created by that question, you have to be able to think about the answer to that question before you ever begin one of these processes. So it's, it's important that you recognize that you sit down and you, you come up with a game plan for creating an environment in which that will be answered. And, it, and for some people, money is the answer. You know, what's in it for me? More money. Okay, great. For some people, money means nothing. For some people, what means it more is a responsibility. I want greater responsibility in my work. Great. That's another way to do it. What's another way? Well, I want a title. Okay, great. We'll find a title that works for you. You know, whatever it happens to be. So in a small firm, it's real easy because you can just ask Mary and Jack and Bill and Fred and Diane exactly what their needs are in that area. What, what stimulates you? What gets your hot button pushed? You know, what, what are you striving for? What do you want to be known for? What do, you want to be, what do you want to accomplish? Those are questions that bosses don't ask their employees in routine. But that's a part of an employee review process that is part of the goal-setting process is to start with those things. Sure, the firm has re requirements of what they want from this person, goals that they want that person to achieve, but we ought to ask the person, what do you want to personally achieve in your in your day-to-day -day activities throughout the course of the next 12 months? So it's, it's about understanding each of them and what, what motivates them. Now, when you get to a bigger firm, and, and understand that I've worked – for the largest firm in the in the world for 11 and a half years. I was their director of operations for, for part of those years, half of those years. And it, you can't possibly do that with every single individual. So you can define a process that's systematized, that addresses those questions in general, and then as you have these conversations, because it's going to be spread out over the group of project managers who are going to conduct these reviews, they ask these questions. So you spread the wealth, you spread it out onto a group of people, and, and in groups of people, you'll begin to get the feedback that you want that builds the system. Excellent. Got it. So we have covered a lot in this segment, Steve, about employee retention, about some of the uh, deficiencies or oversights or what, however we tend to look at it in financial management small firms. And one thing you did mention is that it's your feeling, and I know a lot in the industry feel like um, sometimes salaries are depressed or there would be an opportunity for better re re um, recompense or better better pay in the industry. So in, in the following episode, will you reveal some of the secrets of what firms can do to find some of their hidden dollars and manage their money better? Yeah, but they're not secrets. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I have to it's set it up. It's all out so there for everybody to learn. That's right. That's right. And next week, we're going to dive right into that. So, Steve, it has been great having you on the show today. I feel like well, I've you. learned a ton. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been really great. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And that's a wrap. Thanks for riding along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider, where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment 
except to help you run a great business. Bump Music Credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.